Laudator Jesus Christus, praise be Jesus Christ. This is Matt Gaspers, Managing Editor of Catholic Family News, and I'm joined as always by my friend and colleague, Dr. Brian McCall, who is the Editor-in-Chief of CFN. Hello, Brian. I hope you're doing well today. I am. Happy Friday to you. Yes, another Friday, another another news roundup. Yes. <laughs> We're coming to you on uh, Friday, November 20th, 2020. And today on the, the traditional Roman calendar, it is the Feast of St. Felix of Valois. I think that's how you pronounce the last name. Forgive me if I mispronounced that. He was a, uh, a French priest, hermit, and a confessor of the faith, so not a martyr. And he died in the year of our Lord, 1212. He was a co-founder of the Order of the Most Holy Trinity, also known as the Trinitarians, along with St. John of Matha, whose feast day is February 8th, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of that order was founded, you know, during the time of the, the Crusades and such, was to ransom captives from, who had been enslaved, basically, by Muslims during the, during the Crusades. And as I remarked um, a couple years, I guess last February, when uh, Bishop Athanasius Schneider responded to Pope Francis's Abu Dhabi statement, uh, he published his response on the Feast of St. John of Matha, uh, February 8th. And I said, you know, in the near future, we might need the, the Trinitarians to resume their old, uh, you know, return to their roots and start ransoming captives again. We know, you never know with all of yes. the, uh, all of the Islamic uh, jihad going on throughout the world. So our topics today, uh, before we go to review some of the other saints uh, since our last show are just our topics today are going to include an update on the status of election 2020 tucker carlson quoting archbishop vigano on primetime television that was very exciting to see uh, the usccb fall general assembly not quite so exciting <laughs> and some other church news from europe before we jump into all of that news however uh, a couple other feasts saints that we want to mention since our last show uh, two great female saints in the church. First of all, St. Gertrude the Great on November 16th, uh, a Benedictine nun and a mystic who died in 1302. And she's one of the few saints in the church, whether male or female, who has the honor of having the great attached to her name. Yes. So a very high honor in the church. I can't recall if she's was named a doctor of the church. I don't remember if she is or not. Uh, but she's most well known for uh, receiving private revelations from our Lord, especially concerning his sacred heart, a few centuries before St. Margaret Mary Alacoc. And then the other uh, great female saint that we celebrated yesterday, November 19th, is uh, St. Elizabeth of Hungary, who was a, a princess, a Hungarian princess, a wife, and a mother who became a widow at the young age of 20 and was known for her great generosity to the poor. Mm -hmm. And she, she ended up after her husband uh, died and um, a few years later, I think she ended up renouncing her wealth and privilege and entered the third order of St. Francis becoming one of the first um, third order members of the Franciscan order in German territory. The, the Franciscans had just recently been established there. Yes, very much. She's very similar to St. Bridget of Sweden, who same thing was a royalty, princess, mother, wife, but then at the end of her life, after her children were raised, uh, entered the religious life. So a very similar pattern. Yes. Well, with that, I think we'll jump into our news stories today. Of course, everybody <laughs> is, the, the talk of the town is still the election, presidential election 2020, and we do have some updates to cover for you. I'll let Brian uh, go over those. Right. So uh, a lot's been going on. And uh, as one of the president's lawyers uh, said, uh, I think it was just yesterday, um, you know, this is a massive case. What they're uncovering in terms of fraud is uh, nationwide. It's widespread and is the kind of lawsuit that would probably take years to work through. And they, because of the timelines, of the election have to cram this into a couple of weeks. Uh, so it's things are moving very, very quickly. And part of the problem is they're really fighting two wars, right? Because in many ways, I think we're in a civil war. Right now, it's, it's mostly bloodless. But essentially, they are fighting a civil war uh, for the integrity of our country and the integrity of the electoral process. But they're fighting it on two battlefields, one in the courts, 
but secondly, in front of the fake news media, uh, because the, the, the yes. disinformation out there is extraordinary. It's, it's absolutely extraordinary. And it's almost like anything you hear from the, the as I call them now, the lies stream networks, uh, you know, the lie stream media is just the opposite. Like whatever the truth is, they're going to tell you the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll do a quick rundown, but I think that the media are really losing this war. Uh, it's been reported this week that uh, CNN and Fox News ratings are, are plummeting, are half of what they were. Uh, that their shares, this is a real interesting point, their shares on the stock exchange are plummeting. That people mm -hmm. are dumping their stock because people are realizing these things are, are, are their days are numbered. Wow. Um, so uh, real quickly, the, the key states where things are going on, Pennsylvania, uh, the Trump team still continues to pursue its litigation. They had to put out a statement because, again, the, the lies of the media were, oh, it's over in Pennsylvania. They dropped all their, they dropped their claims. They're only disputing a few, few ballots that are not enough to change the election. Well, the Trump team had to release a statement saying that's not true. What they did was there was a decision out of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, which is where they are, where Pennsylvania is located. They came out in an unrelated case that was really helpful to their case, to their argument. Right. rooted in a different legal argument. And so they amended their argument to take advantage of that, to say, well, actually, this is a stronger argument now. But it didn't mean that they dropped trying to, uh, their, their, their uh, attempt to have 700,000 ballots disqualified. And they state, uh, I'm reading from the Trump announcement, paragraph four of the amended filing reads, Allegheny and Philadelphia counties alone received and processed 682,479 mail-in and absentee ballots without review by the political parties and candidates. These are unprecedented numbers in Pennsylvania's election history. Rather than engaging in an open and transparent process to give credibility to the Pennsylvania brand new voting system, the processes were hidden during the receipt review opening and tabulation of those 682,479 votes. And again, why do they keep quoting this? The media said, oh, they gave up on those close to 700,000 votes, which again, just quoting from their court filing is not the case. Right. Um, so don't believe that you hear they've given up. You may have also heard that all these cases are being dismissed. That's another lie. Uh, there are cases that are, were filed by other people, like just citizens not right. the Trump people. And there are also cases the Trump team filed before the election to try to stop things happening on election day. Well, obviously they're moot at this point that yeah. things happen. So yeah, they just said, okay, well, those cases are over and they let them go. So again, don't, don't believe what, what you hear. Pennsylvania is still, it's, it's incredible what's being uncovered there. Um, new case in Nevada. This one, again, this is where you see that they're using kind of different tactics for different states, depending what works. Here, the electors, and if you remember, the electors are the ones who elect the president. And, what, and when right. you, we vote, we're voting really for a team of electors, right? In right. Nevada, it's six. So there's six people who say, we're going to vote for Trump. Six people who say, we're going to vote for Biden. The six who are committed to Trump are filing a lawsuit saying that they really are the electors. And uh, this, this thing was, you know, uh, it was unconstitutional, illegal, et cetera. Right. So again, there's a case where they say that Trump hasn't filed a case there. Well, it was better under Nevada law for the electors themselves to actually be the, the ones bringing the case. So right. their case has been filed and is, is moving uh, forward. Um, Wisconsin, they're moving forward with a recount. As we've seen in Georgia, what's critical about that is it can't just be a repeat of the fraud from November 3rd into the yes. 4th. It has to be a real audit, um, which doesn't seem to have happened in Georgia, the rush thing there. But that's proceeding in, in Wisconsin. And finally, Michigan. We had a wild night in Michigan uh, this week. So what happens, the way this works is each county gets together and they, they review the election results and then they certify them. They say these election results are final, then they pass them to the state, and then the state has to, based on those individual certifications, certify the whole state. And that's when the electors are appointed under the way most states work. Right. So what happened is Wayne County, where Detroit is, where most of the illegal activity seemed to have gone on, uh, where we had uh, dead people, uh, we had, I heard a funny joke this week, uh, the Vatican's opening a case for the canonization of Joe Biden because he raised more people from the dead than any other saint to go vote on election day. Uh, that's again where a lot of this happened where uh, more people than live in particular precincts voted. Um, 
including ch children <laughs> who can't vote. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, they, the, there are four people on the commission who got together and had to say, do these, these votes, are they certifiable? Is there any, any corruption? They couldn't vote. They couldn't do it. It was deadlocked, no majority. Right. Uh, and then they basically were pressured. The two dis people who said, we can't do this, threatened. According to their reports, they were, their children were threatened. threatened. Uh, oh people uh, were saying, we know your children's names. They read, we know where their schools are and your children are going to pay for this. Uh, and sadly, uh, they, they seem to have caved in during the, again, late at night and voted. But they did it in a weird way. They said, well, we vote to certify, but these election results are fraud, fraudulent, and we urge the state to audit it. Uh, so then the next day, when they were sort of out of the room, they said oh, that vote was obtained under duress. We disavow it. It was illegal. And so now we have the, a new mess um, in that uh, Michigan had to figure out if this was a valid certification or not. Um, right. But again, I don't know how you cert you basically say, we certify these election results are true, but they're false, so look into them, right? It's a, just contradictory. But we now know they were they were threatened. Um, and that's really what we have to pray for here, that this election is going to revolve around some people having the fortitude to put their lives at risk to do what's right, uh, what, what, what truth demands, because people's lives are really being threatened here. Uh, you'll remember uh, there was a judge, a story in, in the, uh, earlier this year, who was the judge in charge of the Delane Maxwell case, uh, who was a, she was an a associate of, of Epstein, who was brought in on charges of child sex trafficking by the Trump mm -hmm. administration. The judge's family, she was threatened to let her out of prison and, and her husband and child were attacked uh, and shot. Uh, and so mm -hmm. this, is, this is what goes on here. So that was the, the nightmare in Michigan. But again, you'll hear that Trump gave up in Michigan. Uh, from the news media, but he released a statement. The lawsuit in Michigan was to stop the meeting and the certification of Wayne County votes. Well, again, there's no point in the lawsuit now. The meeting already happened. We have this bizarre result. We may have litigation over what it means. But again, they said we, we, we got what we wanted, sort of this on the record that Wayne County is a mess. And so that lawsuit's been superseded. So you got to be really careful with the, the mainstream me and what you hear because it's not really true. Um, right. And what we really saw yesterday was extraordinary. Again, because they have to fight this true two front war, they can't just go into court. They have to keep fighting against the media who wants everyone to believe Biden won, it's all over. So right. that when they are victorious, they can rile people up and say, Trump stole this. Because if everybody believes it's over and then it's changed, people won't see the truth that, well, now the truth has come out and, and Trump really won. So the, the, the key people on the legal team uh, had a press conference in Washington yesterday uh, and spoke about uh, what's going on. And they sort of laid out what a lawyer would say is their opening argument, kind of what's the overview yes. of the case, what's going on. Um, and uh, really getting at this, this, this moving target of the media that there's no evidence of fraud. There's no evidence of widespread fraud. There's no evidence of enough fraud to change the election. Uh, right. They haven't presented evidence. And they started to present, you know, show some of the evidence that they're submitting. And it's interesting, Rudy Giuliani, uh, who would know a lot about this, having prosecuted the mob, said, look, I, I can't show you all of this evidence because our witnesses are scared. They're afraid right. if their name's given out that they will be attacked physically. And again, he has pretty much real reason to say that. Um, right. But he did give, he had some permission to give some, and he's going to cite, I want to play a short clip where he gives again some of the example of the just outright fraud. And, and really that this was not just one or two people. This was a concerted effort thought through from the beginning. Uh, so I'm yes. first going to play a little bit of what he talks about happened in Pennsylvania, uh, where they were using absentee votes, where they've caught them to just make up ballots and randomly assign them to people. Mm -hmm. Voter fraud, easily provable, hundreds of witnesses, maybe thousands. We have, um, to give you another example, we have 17,000 provisional ballots cast in Pittsburgh. Do you know what a pro provisional ballot is? Provisional ballot usually happens this way, and about 15 of the 17,000 happen this way. You walk in and you say, I'm here to vote today. Oh, Mr. Giuliani, you already voted. I did? I don't remember voting. Oh, yes, yes, you cast an absentee ballot. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. So why does that happen 17,000 times 
in Pittsburgh. People walked in thinking they actually 15,000 to be precise. Why did it happen 15,000 times that people in Pittsburgh walked in to vote and they had already voted according to the Democrat election machine? Did they forget that many people with uh, bad memories in Pittsburgh? Or is the following correct? That uh, as witnesses will testify, they were instructed by the Democrat bosses when they had a ballot in which there was no one registered, just assign it to somebody. Just assign it to Rudy Giuliani. So when Rudy Giuliani, and maybe Rudy Giuliani won't show up to vote. And if he does show up to vote, we'll give him a provisional ballot. So again, that's kind of old school fraud. So what he said is they ginned up a whole bunch of fake ballots, but right. you have to show that somebody voted. So they said, we'll just start randomly assigning them to people on the election rolls because mm -hmm. um, maybe they won't show up and then uh, uh, and then we'll have but a the problem is that a lot of people did show up <laughs> some people did show up and he said of uh, and again there's always some of these where maybe uh, you know there is just some some error but 15,000 of them he said he's got witnesses to testify that they went in and it was because they had already filled out a ballot for this person and they got caught so they had okay we'll have to do that but uh, again that is uncovering a lots of on the ground fraud. So that went on. And then I'd like to play for you another clip from one of his other superstar lawyers, uh, lawyer Sidney Powell, uh, where she talks about kind of the other front war. So this is the on the ground, filling out pieces of ballots that are ballots that are fraudulent. Like the physical fraud. The physical fraud. Say. Yes. Yeah. Then there's the cyber fraud, the Dominion voting systems, which we now know were created to manipulate elections by the communists. And uh, she is the one really kind of dealing with all this evidence of um, the Dominion fraud. And so she uh, talks a little bit about that, what proof they have coming out of Venezuela. Uh, where this I think they from. mentioned they have an affidavit of someone who was yes. like an eyewitness to the creation of their... Yes. Um, and it's in the, in the, I think she said it's in the um, exhibits for the case in Georgia being handled by Lynn Wood, if I recall correctly. Yes, yes. And then I also want you to hear her kind of closing remark, because this is a very serious lawyer, has a stellar reputation, I think has never lost a case. And I want you to get her confidence level, because if this woman is doing this, she's putting her entire reputation on the line. Because if she brings cases in which there's no evidence and she's going to become a laughing stock, her, her career is over. And again, she has a stellar reputation as a lawyer. Why would someone do this if they knew, as the media claims, there's no, there's no evidence? So I want you to hear, the, again, to really inspire you to keep praying uh, her, her sort of final remarks after she talks about the evidence they're, un, they're uncovering. Um, we know specifically that Venezuela exported it for that purpose to Argentina and other Latin American companies to make sure that the corrupt rulers who were willing to pay the highest price for being in office were allowed to rig their elections. This is stunning, heartbreaking, infuriating, and the most unpatriotic acts I can even imagine for people in this country to have participated in, in any way, shape, or form. And I want the American public to know right now that we will not be intimidated. American patriots are fed up with the corruption from the local level to the highest level of our government, and we are going to take this country back. We are not going to be intimidated. We are not going to back down. We are going to clean this mess up now. President Trump won by a landslide. We are going to prove it, and we are going to reclaim the United States of America for the people who vote for freedom. And again, this is what Archbishop Beacon was talking about. She just set this in its proper context. This is not Bush v. Gore in 2000, where it's sort of, well, who won? What's the? This is a communist revolution. This is an attempted communist takeover of our country. Uh, which has been financed by communists, we know, through the, the Biden family's ties, uh, which has been used a voting system developed by Victor Chavez and Bioro, uh, who Trump, President Trump has been very strong with, the communist rulers in, uh, 
uh, Venezuela, was created and sold to Latin American dictators to keep themselves in power. It is their oper communist operatives around the country uh, who went in and, and told workers what to do and how to cheat and orchestrated uh, this, in the words of Joe Biden himself on tape when he said that, quote, we have created the largest, most diverse voter fraud organization in history. Uh, now again, they all said that was a slip of the tongue, but uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, maybe it was his one moment of honesty. And that's what's important. That's what she's telling this is about. And that's what Archbishop Vigano says. This isn't just an election. This is an attempt of the communists to turn our country, as Our Lady of Fatima warned us, into a communist country by taking it over, uh, by stealing this election. And that's why, notice, we will not be intimidated, meaning I don't care what you threaten us with. Uh, and fortunately, we are fortunate to have, uh, as, as Arch Vigano says, uh, those uh, protectors of the children of light, those who are fighting on the side against the evils of communism to stay this course. So, so um, another, and, an, another encouraging news in that regard is the, the massive numbers of people who turned out in our nation's capital uh, this past Saturday, November 14th, ten, at least tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of Americans gathered in, in Washington, D.C., mm. excuse me, Washington, D.C., for what's called the Million MAGA March, a peaceful demonstration in support of President Trump. And our friend and colleague, Dr. Taylor Marshall was there and was able to read a special message composed by Archbishop Vigano for the occasion to a crowd gathered outside the United States Supreme Court building. We have that posted on our website as Brian is displaying on the screen now. We're just gonna play a brief uh, clip from that video so you can get a flavor for the video and we encourage you to go watch the whole thing on our on our website do you believe in god yeah. do you believe that your rights come from god not from men yeah. are you pro-life yeah. our president is the most pro-life president in the history of the united states of america donald john trump yeah. A great global leader, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, wrote a special wrote a special note of encouragement that I would like to read to you today as a pastoral epistle to all of us gathered here to support America and our president. Don and again, then he goes on to uh, to read from Archbishop Vigano's uh, letter. Yes. Uh, and again, this is showing us this is not just about politics. I mean, this is, as Taylor Marshall said, this is about fundamental, where do where does law come from? Where do our legal rights come from? They come from man, as the popes have warned us, what man giveth, man can taketh away, right? Mm -hmm. they, they come, if our rights come from the government, then the government can take them away. If our, if our law is rooted in the divine and natural law, then they can't. And again, to have someone like Taylor Marshall standing up there addressing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people uh, by best estimates uh, is is showing this is a a larger uh, larger conflict uh, and and to show you a sense i want to show you there's somebody collected some sort of footage um, there's been a lot of dispute the news media wrote this off as you know a few thousand people um, there's been claims as up, upwards to a million um, but i i want to play a little short video of someone who sort of collected some footage to show you yourself and you can judge uh, about about how big you think this is. Uh, this actually I got from a, a channel called Dr. Steve Turley, who actually, if I'd recommend, uh, he he seems very good. If you, again, turn off the TV, stop listening if you still have it, hopefully, you know, pull the plug. Uh, we need to look other sources. And he's, he's a, uh, a professor, I think he's Greek Orthodox, he's, he is what I understand, but he okay. is a really good person who just read some really good facts out there. Uh, and for this is from his channel. Uh, and again, it'll just give you a sense of the size of the people that were listening to our, our friend, Dr. Marshall. Again, that I I can tell. I went to a Trump rally that had like fifty thousand people. Uh, that's dwarfs that that I that I was in the midst of. So, right. Um, this is like I said. I think we are in the midst of a, a at this point mostly bloodless civil war, but there is a civil war for the soul of this country going on. And I say mostly. It's a sad end to this story. 
uh, is apparently uh, the the violent the the violent forefront of the, the the communist coup Antifa Black Lives Matter followed a lot of those people back to their hotels and attacked them after the march under cover of darkness under like cover. the cowards that they are yes yes they threw uh, explosives at people they beat uh, an older gentleman up. Uh, Taylor Marshall and his son, his young son, were couldn't even get into their hotel. They had jumped on the metro and got out of D.C. Hope they got their money back from their hotel, but they weren't even able to get into their hotel um, because, again, that march was completely pro was completely peaceful. Really, was a peaceful yes. protest. People, and that's what I experienced at a Trump rally. I went to happy people, people who were just good natured. I mean, a huge crowd, but no kind of anger or angst, just everybody really in a good mood. And then as soon as it dispersed and the cover of darkness, as Matt said, the violence, real radical violence uh, uh, came out. So uh, saying we will not be intimidated means a lot because we are living in a place where people are having to put their lives at risk to stand up for the truth. Yes. So uh, we mentioned in, you know, Taylor Marshall reading the, the special message from Archbishop Vigano. And as I mentioned in the introduction to our show today, another very hope, high profile individual known to most of our viewers, I'm sure, uh, Tucker Carlson, mm -hmm. also quoted, Arch we were very happy to see him quote Archbishop Vigano on primetime television. So uh, viewers may recall, just to give a little background to, to how this unfolded, uh, His Excellency wrote an open letter to President Trump late last month uh, it was published on October 30th and dated October uh, 25th, the Feast of Christ the King in the traditional calendar, in which uh, Archbishop Vigano focused on the theme of the so-called Great Reset, a globalist initiative pushed by the World Economic Forum and people like uh, George Soros uh, and others. And we discussed all of that on, uh, during our October 30th show, the same day that uh, Vigano's letter was published on our website and other outlets. So if you need a refresher on that, I encourage you to go watch our October 30th news roundup. And also more recently, Archbishop Vigano granted an interview in which he decried the globalist dictatorship, that's what he called it, stating, quote, we are witnessing a planned and highly organized attack which avails itself of the collaboration of significant parts of institutions, almost the entire media, as Brian was stressing, and the financing of multinational powers and international organizations. And he said all of that in reference to the 2020 presidential election. And further in the same interview, he, he said, quote, the global left, in order to gain power and also to maintain it, has always and only used the violence of either weapons, the violence that Brian just described, the Antifa and BLM folks, or fraud. We think of socialist totalitarianism as well as its various incarnations as Nazism, fascism, and communism. And Archbishop Vigano is absolutely right. That's what we're seeing. It's uh, almost beyond belief to see it in the United States of America, what for so many generations has been considered the bastion of freedom. Uh, so this week, Tuesday, as I said, none other than Tucker Carlson, America's highest rated cable news network anchor, discussed the Great Reset and actually quoted from Archbishop Vigano's open letter to President Trump. We're going to play a, a clip of that for you in case you may have missed the broadcast. Others think he really doesn't care, so instead he says what he thinks is true. A few weeks ago, he wrote a letter to President Donald Trump assessing the lockdowns from a perspective you almost never hear in this country. No one up until last February, Vagano wrote, would ever have thought that in all of our cities, citizens would be arrested simply for wanting to walk down the street, to breathe, to want to keep their businesses open, to want to go to church on Sunday. Yet now it is happening all over the world. The fundamental rights of citizens and believers are being denied in the name of a health emergency that is revealing itself more and more fully as instrumental to the establishment of an inhuman faceless tyranny." End quote. Now you may not have heard those words before, and there's a reason for that. The usual foot soldiers for conformity in our news media did their best to suppress and discredit Vagano's letter to the president, Yahoo News tried to tie the elderly clergyman somehow to QAnon, which to them made sense. 
He alleged that a global health emergency was being used by the people in power for ends that had nothing to do with the virus itself. And of course, that's crazy talk. It's a conspiracy theory, Russian disinformation, probably racist. Better pull it off the internet right away. Censor those ideas before they infect the whole country. That's the media position on that. The only problem is that what Vagano wrote is actually true. Again, it's extraordinary to see uh, you know, someone talking about Archbishop Vigano and, and not doing what you know, the rest of the media did, dismissing him as a, a crazy person, right. uh, or as the Vatican's been doing, trying to discredit him through that McCarrick report we reported on last week, uh, but, but saying it's true. What he's saying is true. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really, I think, to get, to get this word out. And hopefully uh, some people who heard that who maybe have not heard these things before went and looked up Archbishop Vigano. Uh, in the written version of that story, Tucker Carlson actually links to the uh, letter of Archbishop Vigano as published on Catholic Family News website. Uh, yes. So hopefully some people clicked on that and, and actually read the words of the, uh, as Taylor Marshall said, a pastoral epistle of uh, Archbishop Vigano. Yes, exactly right. But sadly, Archbishop Vigano is uh, not the whole story of what's going on in the church. <laughs> no, certainly not. And sadly, he's no longer our uh, apostolic nuncio. We... <laughs> no. So no. this week, uh, Monday and Tuesday of this week, November 16th through 17th, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, uh, abbreviated USCCB, held their fall general assembly. The conference typically gathers twice a year. And as a humorous introduction, I guess, to this story, we're going to show you an image of a very unfortunate, very bizarre tweet that was posted on the official USCCB Twitter account. Now, it was later removed, and I'll read to you what they said, but yeah. just to show you, I think Brian... But yes, they, they put this out to the entire world. Again, their official account. Yes. We meet tomorrow for our first every... Uh, I think yeah, it was they didn't, ever. They didn't even have a spell check. All, all yeah. virtual <laughs> general assembly. How many baby Yoda gifs do you think <laughs> we'll post during UCCB 20? Uh, I mean, this is just, again, Matt will mention their statement, but these are princes of the church who are supposed to be engaging in a very serious act of governance of the church. And this is what they think is funny right they and, think if you, and if you notice at the bottom of this the screenshot that i captured they actually started they actually posted one image of the baby yoda and, and had the number one so <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, again yeah. just th these are uh, and they want people to take them seriously right, and then they wonder why people don't take them seriously with this kind of nonsense so they did end up uh, about a day later you know this was a, that baby yoda tweet was posted on sunday evening i believe in preparation for yes. the next day so early the next morning they had deleted it and issued this statement we have used light-hearted interactions during the past few meetings but we recognize a tweet posted yesterday unrelated to the work of the conference so they can't even bring themselves to identify what tweet it is <laughs> yeah. uh, was inappropriate and has been removed now, we don't know who runs the USCCB yeah. account, but good grief, they should have, if that's the kind of judgment that they have, they should be out of a job. <laughs> well, again, this is the whole thing. I mean, this is a, a laughable level, but this is the whole problem with the, the McCarrick et al. problem. They basically do idiotic things, like promote a known homosexual predator, and then go, oh, we didn't realize, we realized that was inappropriate. Oops. Right. Uh, with, you know, with no, no consequence. Again, this is on a kind of a silly level, but it's in endemic, epidemic kind of, of what their whole attitude towards, towards the church uh, right. is not supernaturalized, clearly. It's either, it's either that or as the meeting itself kind of showed, you know, the bishops apparently approved three quote-unquote action items, as they're called, during the assembly, yes. and the, the items really sound more like things that would be considered by Congress or a corporate <laughs> uh, gathering yes. rather than successors of the apostles. I can't imagine if if uh, Saints Peter and Paul were to come down from heaven and, and uh, view some of these proceedings, yes. <laughs> would they recognize these men as their successors? I don't know. <laughs> so do you um, want to tell us a little bit about what those three proposals were? <laughs> yes, let me, let me pull those up real quick here. All right, so this is an official uh, press release 
from the USCCB. It says U.S. bishops approved three action items dur uh, during 2020 General Assembly. The USCCB approved today three action items at their fall uh, 2020 Fall General Assembly. The full body of bishops approved the revised strategic priorities. Again, that sounds like corporate speech. Corporate, yes. For the 2021 through 2024 USCCB strategic plan. So <laughs> again, like, is this a corporation or a gathering of bishops of the Catholic Church? It's hard to tell. Um, and that this plan is called created anew by the body and blood of Christ, source of our healing and hope. Uh, the bishops also voted to approve the renewal of the ad hoc committee against racism that focuses on addressing the sin of racism. The committee was established in August 2017 upon the unanimous recommendation of the USCCB's executive committee and in consultation with members of the USCCB's committee on priorities and plans. Um, and then the last thing was had to do with their annual budget, I guess. So uh, pretty, pretty light on matters of faith. Uh, I mean, I guess you could argue a little bit matters of morals with the whole sin of racism, but wow, it's, uh, it's amazing to see. <clears throat> yes. Uh, and then interestingly towards the, I think the end of this, uh, uh, get together, uh, they, the archbishop, uh, Jose Gomez, who is yes. this year the president of the USCCB, uh, issued a statement in which he expressed sort of concerns about uh, Biden, who again he keeps recognizing is the president-elect. Uh, I didn't know Gomez became the counter of the electoral votes. Right. <laughs> uh, but he says, uh, he has given us reason to believe that his faith commitments will move him to support some good policies. Okay. Uh, immigration <laughs> reform, refugees and the poor, against racism, the death penalty, climate change. He has also given us reason to believe that he will support policies that are against some fundamental values that we hold dear as Catholics. Um, and the translation for that yeah. statement is policies that contradict divine and natural law. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And we know... Uh, um, what those are. These policies pose a serious threat to the common good whenever any politician supports them. But when politicians who profess the Catholic faith support them, there are additional problems. Among other things, it creates confusion. Well, with all due respect, uh, your, your grace, you know, why, why then were you congratulating him on being the second pres Catholic president in the United States and celebrating, again, these issues, which again, I think he's wrong on, but are of you know, minor comparison compared to the things on which he departs from natural and divine law, right? There is no natural and divine law on immigration reform, right? right. And, uh, you know, how can you sort of say, oh, he has got some good things. Oh, but, you know, there's some bad things too. I mean, this that's is... That's a cause of confusion right uh, that's there. That's the cause of confusion exactly yeah. right there. Uh, so again, nothing good coming out of this uh, bureaucratic meeting in Washington. The force may have been with them, but it certainly wasn't the force of the <laughs> Holy Ghost. Right. And he, he ends his uh, statement regarding, you know, the situation with Biden. He says, this is a difficult and complex situation. Well, with all due oh, respect, yeah. it really isn't. <laughs> it isn't, no. The situation and the manner in which to deal with it is actually quite simple. And I just want to read very quickly before we move on. Here's how St. Paul says, these are his instructions to St. Titus in the New Testament, a fellow bishop, on how to deal with these situations. Quote, a man who is a heretic, for example, Joe Biden, <laughs> after the first and second admonition, avoid, knowing that he that is such a one is subverted and sinneth, being condemned by his own judgment. So this is what the bishops need to be doing. They need to be formally, canonically admonishing Joe Biden, specifically his local ordinary should be doing this, mm. um, to say, you either need to recant your errors or you are cut off, you are excommunicated from the church by your own judgment, as St. Paul says. It's not the bishops, you know, the mean uh, church hierarchy doing it. You're doing this to yourself. We're simply proclaiming what you've already done to yourself. Yes, yes. And so it is not complex. It is, as Matt said, very, very simple. Yes. Well, staying with the church, but heading over to Rome, we talked about the, the globalist plan, the Great Reset. 
Uh, again, see our October 30th news roundup for some more on that. But as Archbishop Vigano said, this has been a, a coalition of forces within the deep state and the deep church that are, yes. we are fighting against. And we have no more evidence of it than our next story, because uh, the Vatican is launching a, uh, a, a, an event uh, that is really the equivalent of the World Economic Forum in Davos, where the Great Reset was announced uh, for the secular world politically. And it's really the Great Reset uh, of the church, Francis's partition, participation in it. It's called the Economy of Francesco. Uh, yes. This online virtual conference, which is going to have a 24-hour period of people people talking. Yes. Um, and essentially what this is, is the Great Reset, as we've talked about, is an attempt to implement communism. It's to reset yes. the economy as communism. Right. And that's exactly, well, again, how do you judge a conference? You judge it by the speakers. Right? Yes. You say, who's coming here? And are these solid Catholics? Do we have, uh, you know, a Taylor Marshall coming to talk about uh, Catholic social teaching and the principles of a Catholic economy? Right. Uh, no. Uh, the people we have coming are uh, like the, we're going to present two of them, which are enough to discredit this entire conference. So Matt's going to talk about Jeffrey Sachs, someone we've mentioned in the paper previously. Yes. So uh, Catholic News Agency published a report uh, yesterday Headline reads, Economy of Francesco speaker Jeffrey Sachs, an advocate for contraception and, quote, reproductive justice, in other words, population control. And the report says, the Economy of Francesco summit, which I think is geared towards young, specifically towards young entrepreneurs, as I understand it, kicked off Thursday with economist Jeffrey Sachs serving as a mentor for young, quote, change makers. Is that like the equivalent of a community organizer or something <laughs> to create a new world economy? So again, the same thing, the Great Reset. They're yeah. talking about a reset of capitalism in favor basically of communism, socialism. Uh, so the report goes on, Sachs, who has participated in numerous Vatican events in recent years, is an advocate for population control initiatives calling for the provision of contraception in the developing world and a supporter of UN initiatives that call for universal access to abortion. And he's also a, a big advocate of the UN's so-called sustainable development goals. Uh, so and again, Francis has mentioned those in his, uh, yes. in, uh, his encyclicals. Uh, and again, that's the code, sustainable development means, well, we need to sustain our economy by killing off the population, right? So we need to have sustainable development. So we don't need to produce much food because we want to reduce. And by reduce, these UN officials are talking about reducing the world's population by 75% in some cases. Uh, and this man, Sachs, is at the heart of it. This is what the man believes. We need to kill right. off our population so that we are, are smaller and let the world, Mother Nature, control right. our planet. He's also a buddy-buddy with, um, what's his name, Bishop Marcello uh, Sir, Sanchez Sanchez. Sarando, I think is his name. Yes. Who's the, uh, the bishop who went over to communist China a couple of years ago before the secret deal was signed. And when he got back, he, he said, you know, the Chinese communists, the, the people who are best implementing the church's social doctrine are the Chinese communists. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Right. The, the, which the social doctrine, which condemned communism is inherently evil and can never be worked with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Satanic scourge. Satanic scourge. Pius yes. XI. Yes. So if you think that's bad enough, the sax guy, uh, another person is there, a, a Brazilian uh, named Leonardo Boff. Uh, and I'm just going to actually show you uh, uh, his picture here. Uh, here he is. Looks kind of like an old hippie. Right. <laughs> uh, but you may not know from his picture, he's a former Franciscan. Yes, uh, so and this a was, former, and a, technically a priest. You mean yes, he left the, the yes. practice of the priesthood. But. You're right, I should have said Franciscan priest, true, very yeah. correct. Uh, but uh, uh, he is one of the oldest members of what's called liberation theology. And liberation theology was a movement started by the communist revolutionaries to infiltrate the church in Latin America, yes. where the idea was to unify, to bring together communism and the catholic church to make communism a tenet of the catholic church uh, right. which again probably the, the best symbol of this horrible heretical system is that uh, blasphemous crucif hammer and sickle crucifix yes that Pope francis received uh, welcomed welcomely received from Evo morales a communist dictator from i believe it's yes. bolivia one of the south american countries 
Yes. And uh, for, for viewers who may not be aware of this, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, when it was run by Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, condemned liberation theology for, among other reasons, having concepts, quote, uncritically borrowed from Marxist ideology. Uh, now, that's important because, as many of our viewers know, the modern Vatican has not condemned a lot in the last 60 years, right? There's very, very few. I mean, James Martin, Father, you know, is out there and has not been condemned uh, in this way. So for the Vatican to actually condemn this movement means it had to be not just bad, but radically, radically bad. Right. Um, and so it was condemned by, by them. In 1984, the Vatican demanded that this boff, uh, be silent and obedient for the book that he had written, saying that that book showed, quote, a profound misunderstanding of the Catholic faith. In 2001, uh, he had described the Vatican of Pope uh, John Paul II as, as, quote, highly fundamentalist. So that was his <laughs> response uh, for a book that was profoundly misunderstanding the Catholic faith. And apparently this Leonardo Boff also accused then Cardinal Ratzinger of being a, quote, religious terrorist. Yes. Yes. At that point, trying to uphold basic doctrine. <laughs> yes. And so that was in 84. In 92, as Matt already mentioned, he left the priesthood and the Franciscan order uh, and has been advocating for socialist wealth redistribution and protection of the environment. Right. So here we have someone whose entire book philosophy has been condemned by even the post-conciliar church, said he has a profound misunderstanding of the Catholic faith. He was laicized and hasn't recanted this. Still, it goes on saying the same thing. And Pope Francis invites him back to the Vatican right. to be a keynote speaker to talk about the church's teaching on economy. Again, what right. more proof do you have uh, that this that the Francis's Vatican is part of the Great Reset communist takeover that again is being fought in our country in the courthouses and state legislatures across our country in this election that is a communist coup uh, is being fought and is and that the Vatican is part of this. Uh, and Boff's and connection to Francis actually goes deeper than simply this particular event. I remember uh, when our friend John Venari was still living, and I remember him publishing articles about Boff was actually a um, rehabilitated by Pope Francis pretty early on in Francis's pontificate and actually made a consultor for the the uh, writing of the the eco encyclical Laudato Si mm. so Boff Boff is not just he's not just being brought in for this one time event he's like a close collaborator and basically a confidant of Pope Francis and Laudato Si of course is lauded by all of the globalists I've, I've seen footage of globalists praising it to the rooftops as you know the most wonderful encyclical that's ever been written by a pope ever because it's uh, affirming their nefarious agenda the sustainable development goals and and affirming climate change and all the other all their other uh, agenda items so yes yes very true so again, clear evidence of this. This is the Catholic version of the global reset to uh, communism. Yes. So our final story, uh, again, is a, a story that has a, a good, good bit of hope, I think, in it. Uh, as our, our viewers may know, uh, Europe has, is already ahead of us, is where Joe Biden promised to bring this country uh, if he gets his hands on the levers of power. Uh, a complete, total shutdown to bring to the rest of our country what's going on in places mm -hmm. like New York, uh, and, and California. Uh, so in France, there's been an ordered complete shutdown of the country. Uh, in, I think October 30th. October 30th, yes. That includes a ban on the celebration of mass. Uh, and so e in France, even though you can go to a crowded restaurant, travel on crowded pu public transportation, the metro system, go buy tobacco in crowded stores, you can't go into a church and a priest cannot offer mass publicly. And so when the first lockdowns came in the spring, many people trusted their bishops who told them, we have to do this. This is really serious. We need to do this. It'll be over soon. Uh, the good news is this time people are waking up. So when, Including some of, the, some of the lower clergy and actually I think even yes. a few bishops in France. Yes. So people are waking up and saying, no, we are not going to allow the communist suppression. Because again, what do communists do? They suppress religion and the church is their first target. And so thousands of French Catholics in about 30 locations in France uh, engaged in a protest of these totalitarian 
uh, martial law, effectively, is really what it is. Uh, that and shut specifically down, anti-Catholic martial specifically law. Specifically yeah. anti-Catholic, yes, yeah, shutting down. Uh, and so they gathered around, and I'll show a brief click, clip that LifeSite News provided of uh, some of these, these movements. <laughs> And uh, to emphasize the Catholic nature of it, if any of our viewers have been on the Chartres pilgrimage every year, you will recognize that song. Uh, that is a song to, to Our Lady. Uh, there's kind of the, the I guess, uh, unofficial, not theme song, I don't know what you'd call it, but the pilgrimage song of, uh, ah, okay. of the Chartres pilgrimage. So it's a uh, Chez Nous, uh, you know, uh, which is again, a hymn to our, a song to Our, our Lady, uh, celebrating her, Our Lady of Chartres particularly. Uh, and again, you will hear it all throughout the three the three days if you're walking on the road between Paris and Chartres, and then, uh, and particularly at the end, it's, it gets belted out. Uh, it's very, very Catholic, and and very much in Catholic culture is a kind of a rallying song yes. uh, for for French Catholics. So again, French this need is, to recover the the Catholic soul of their nation for sure. They definitely do. But again, this inspired me of hope. It brought back to me memories of uh, being there in France. Uh, hearing so many young Catholics uh, sing out this this great uh, uh, hymn to Our Lady. And I want to just want to very briefly read this quote from a French governmental official. This is basically what they're reacting to or, or responding to. Uh, this is a gentleman named Gerard Dar uh, Darmanin, who's the French Minister of the Interior, as LifeSite reports, and he's basically in charge of public order and also of religious worship, as far as the state is mm. concerned. This is what he said. Quote, I'm telling the Catholics of France, as I also tell the Jews of France and the Protestants, notice not the Muslims, <laughs> interesting omission, yes, it is. that freedom of worship is very important. We have left places of worship open. Well, it doesn't do you any good if you're not allowed to go inside and right. actually worship. <laughs> yes. Places of worship can go on doing worship with a minister of worship who can continue to do his off office and even film it. Oh, well, thank you for thank that you. concession. <laughs> But here's what he says, but life, meaning physical life, is more important than everything. And life means fighting the coronavirus. This is what these people want us to think that our entire life needs to be about, is fighting the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. He says, I don't desire to send police forces to issue tickets to believers who are in front of a church, but obviously if this is a repetitive act, and this is manifestly contrary to the laws of the Republic, I will do it. So I don't want to be a dictator, but I will be one. <laughs> Unbelievable. And yes, again, uh, clearly this is, this is what is wrong with our society. That life is more important than eternal life. That the natural, this is naturalism. This is the, uh, the error of naturalism, that uh, the natural world is greater than the uh, supernatural. That's the error of naturalism that has been uh, condemned by, by the church. Uh, and, and again, this is the disorientation, the diabolical disorientation of our, our times. Uh, and, and this sort of, oh, you can still film it. Again, obviously watching a live stream or a video of a mass can be a devotional practice. I mean, that if you have nothing else, if you're sick, if you're home, that can help, just like reading your missal to, to honor the Lord's day. Um, if you can't, but it is not the same as being physically present, right? The, the, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is about physical presence, right? Presence. Our Lord is truly, really, and substantially present, and we need to be present there, unless, again, we have a, 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 a reason. And to just show this disorientation, there was another uh, sort of infamous tweet this week that came from Bishop Rick Stika, uh, where he tweeted, the Mass is not the worship of Jesus. Yes, and again, uh, this actually is actually tweeted a while back, but yeah, lots of people yes. have gotten screenshots of it. Yeah. Of this, yes, this this week. It was sort of floating around a lot. I should have said that, yes. He tweeted a while ago, but it's been floating around. And again, yes. he's essentially as confused as this poor bureaucrat in France. Well, if the mass isn't the worship of God, then it's not the mass, right? I mean, right. I, I, could you imagine St. Peter, as Matt said, being here and say, a successor of yours publicly said the mass isn't the worship of God. 
I mean, that's, that's how far we've come. Uh, and the good news is, again, to leave on that hope, people are rising up. Yes. The, the, I wanted the, to, good, yeah, the good that, that God's bringing out is that people are waking up to the deep state and the deep church. And I are, to, yes. Before we close up, I wanted to read one very uh, stirring quote from a father, Michel Vio, I uh -huh. think. Uh, and this is what he said. He's still, he, let's see, the nation, I'm reading from the, the LifeSide News report. The, the nationwide movement kicked off on Friday evening with an official rally in front of St. Sol, Sulpice. St. Sulpice. Yes. Yes. And this is what the, one of the priests who was there said, quote, suppressing mass is equivalent to suppressing Catholicism. What is not negotiable is the necessity of the mass. We need to prepare Christmas as it should be. And I'll also remind readers in late October, Pope Francis has apparently already canceled public celebration of Christmas in Rome. So this priest goes on to say, and here's where really uh, the, the heart of the matter, we were weak enough to sacrifice Holy Week and Easter. We will not have the weakness to sacrifice Christmas. They can send all the police forces in France to inflict fines, even within our churches, but we will be there all the same, end quote. We will not be intimidated. Yes. Again, seeing the connections here. Uh, and again, I'll just add uh, um, uh, on a, a kind of related note showing this, uh, this week, Taylor Marshall also talked about the suppression of Thanksgiving here. Again, not a religious holiday per se, but we know Christmas is next. And how, you know, he said, invite people to mass and over to your house for Thanksgiving. And a bishop, I think was it? Uh, same, was the very it? same, same bishop. bishop yes. Yep. Said, uh, called Taylor Marshall, he's just a nut. And I hope, I hope his family gets visited on Thanksgiving, which, again, ominously sounds like I hope the police come and arrest this guy. Or, I think he said doesn't get visited. Or doesn't, yeah. I hope yeah. he doesn't get visited. Uh, excuse right. me, doesn't get visited, which sort of an ominous, you're breaking the law, and, you know, the police may be after you. And, again, it is not our bishops who are standing up. It is lower clergy, like Matt said, priests and laity who are waking up. Uh, and there's a good that God's bringing out of this. He is bringing out that people are seeing this and are coming back to prayer, coming back to the essentials. Yes. And speaking and, of prayer, as we, as we always do on this show, we will end with uh, two prayers that we've been saying of late. The, the prayer that Archbishop Vigano composed for the re-election of President Trump, because as we've emphasized during this show, the, the election is not yet over. It's not officially decided. And then also the prayer written by uh, Sister Marie of St. Peter for the uh, overcoming of communist forces. Yes, and that was a prayer uh, that was really a, a beloved prayer of our uh, late colleague, John Venari, that he used to promote uh, when he was here. And that's how it came to our attention. Yes. So we'll start with the, the prayer of Archbishop Vigano. In the name of the Father, Amen. and of the Son, and, the Son, and of the Holy, Holy Ghost. Ghost. Amen. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, King of kings and Lord of lords, graciously turn your gaze to us who invoke you with confidence. Bless us, citizens of the United States of America. Grant peace and prosperity to our nation. Illuminate those who govern us so that they may commit themselves to the common good in respect for your holy law. Protect those who, defending the inviolable principles of the natural law and your commandments, must face the repeated assaults of the enemy of the human race. Keep in the hearts of your children courage for the truth, love for virtue, and perseverance in the midst of trials. Make our families grow in the example that our Lord has given us, together with his most holy mother and Saint Joseph in the home of Nazareth. Give to our fathers and mothers the gift of strength to educate wisely the children with which you have blessed them. Give courage to those who, in spiritual combat, fight the good fight as soldiers of Christ against the furious forces of the children of darkness. Keep each one of us, O Lord, in your most sacred heart, and above all, him whom your providence has placed at the head of our nation. Bless the President of the United States of America, so that, aware of his responsibility and his duties, he may be a knight of justice a defender of the oppressed, a firm bulwark against your enemies, and a proud supporter of the children of light. 
place the United States of America and the whole world under the mantle of the Queen of Victories, our unconquered leader in battle, the Immaculate Conception. It is thanks to her and through your mercy that the hymn of praise rises to you, O Lord, from the children whom you have redeemed in the most precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And I think Brian's going to read for us the second prayer. Yes. Prayer for the against communists in particular. Eternal Father, I offer thee the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the instruments of his holy passion, that thou mayest put division in the camp of thy enemies. For as thy beloved Son hath said, a kingdom divided against itself shall fall. Amen. Our Lady Amen. of Our Lady of Fatima, pray for, pray us. for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Well, thank you for listening uh, this week. Please, can, please, if you like this content, subscribe to our channel. Uh, sign up for updates from our website. Uh, we have been we post post uh, written stories on our website frequently, and uh, several videos uh, throughout the week. We had a really Great interesting new interview. Yeah. Yes, with uh, Julia yeah. Maloney, who's written a a book to be published soon on the St. Gallen Mafia that uh, has infiltrated the church. Uh, really a phenomenal interview if you haven't seen that yet. Uh, so please share, subscribe, share the content, the videos. And as always, if you like our free content, please consider a, a yearly subscription to Catholic Family News, uh, which you can receive in paper format or in ele electronic only. Uh, the day it's published, it'll be immediately on your computer, no waiting for, for the mail. Uh, please sign up. Again, a lot of the issues we talk about here, as you notice, we run out of time. We don't have enough time to give all the explanation. The monthly papers, uh, 26, 27 pages of newsprint with a lot more uh, detail, as well as inspiring uh, devotional material, way, ways that you can mm -hmm. deepen your faith in addition to the analysis you've come to trust. So yes. thank you for your continued support. Let's keep praying in this together to defend our nation and our church, uh, yes. because we know with God on our side, we cannot fail. And we wish all of you next uh, next week, Thursday, those in the U.S., a happy yes. Thanksgiving. Yes, do enjoy Thanksgiving some time with your, with your family. We'll see you next week. Peter, peace, 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 peace,